Thank you for joining us today for Nappy's uh, Brown Bag Series. This is brought to you by Nappy's PitchCon, where you can register to pitch your show ideas to top-level executives in the business. Go to pitchcon.org to find out mo more. And uh, if you want $70 off of your registration, use promo code NATP, N-A-T-P-E, TV, B, B. That's NATP, TV, B, B. That code's good only for the next 24 hours. Uh, today we're joined by uh, Jeff Monahan. Uh, he's in the Pittsburgh area with people uh, such as George Romero, Tom Savini, John Russo. Content creators seem to flourish in the Pittsburgh area. I think the cold there makes people very creative. Uh, and I've become good friends with Jeff Monahan over the past several years. Uh, he runs a company called 72nd Street Films in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, he has an extensive career as an actor who successfully made the leap to producer, writer, and director on various projects. Jeff, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jack, for having me. Pleasure to be here. Glad to have you. Uh, Jeff, let's jump right into it. Um, you started your career as a, as a police officer. Um, yeah. And... What did you exactly do for the police, and how did that lead to you working as an actor in the business? Well, I actually wanted to be an actor first. I was really shy in school, and I couldn't talk to girls and, you know, stammer all over myself. And um, I had a, a little acting class as part of my English class in 10th grade, Mrs. Griffin's English class. We had six weeks of creative dramatics, and uh, I had to write a little play uh, and act in it, and when I did that, I just came out of my shell like I never had before. I was able to talk and be in a room and do things, and it was a fairly wacky play, so I was doing some fairly wacky things, and so the whole acting thing hit back in 10th grade, but after that class ended, and it was only a six-week stint, um, I just got all shy again, and I didn't know what to do, and I thought about pursuing acting, and my father talked me out of it for all of the right reasons, and said, you know, you'll, you know, you'll starve and, you know, live in a shopping cart somewhere, or whatever, you know, all those, all those terrible stories, which are true, but I, uh, I, I wasn't sure about it enough, and I thought, well, you know, and it was kind of a silly thought, but I was, you know, 16 or 18, and I remember, well, you know, I couldn't be Dirty Harry in the movies, I just, you know, go off and be Dirty Harry. And that didn't work out, but I, I ended up uh, going through Penn State for law enforcement and really enjoyed it. Got a job as a police officer. They sent me to the police academy, graduated at the top of my class doing that, and then uh, got into undercover narcotics, oddly enough. So and you're the guy on Breaking Bad, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I got deeper and deeper into that and was really doing well with it and uh, quite successful at things along that line. And after that, I went into the detective division and into uniform, which is what I really loved to do, being on the street and in the car and dealing with people. Um, but I realized that that was acting, what I was doing, in a really real way. And I had pulled that off without getting shot in the head. And, um, I was working with a, an older police officer who was about to retire, and he said, kid, it's like the Army. You get in, you do a couple of years, you get out. Don't stay in it careful like me. And I thought, yeah, you're right, you know, because so many police officers have, you know, you basically see people at their worst all the time. You're not, it's not a very happy life. Uh, and I love doing it eight hours, ten hours a day, but it, it changes you, as any job does. So I with a complete about face and said, I, I, I want to go back and act, and do films, do theater, and study acting. And so that, that was the sort of sort of the turning point. So I'm really thrilled that I did the police work, and I'm really thrilled that I stopped. And they, you know, it, was, uh, it was a great experience. So you have a, a fairly impressive list of, uh, of films that you've appeared in on the IMDb. Uh, a lot of them uh, related to the Pittsburgh crew of filmmakers like George Romero and Tom Savini, um, which I think it's interesting that you stick together as a very close-knit film community up there. I, I know that you, you were acting for a while, and then you started trying your hand at screenwriting, and I know you've had some success with that. And, and w what made you try your hand at screenwriting? I was living in New York, uh, the first script I wrote was actually sort of autobiographical about undercover narcotics, but I was living in New York after that, 
And I was auditioning for things that I really didn't want to play. And it's a struggle getting an agent, and then once you get the agent to get the auditions and get the callbacks and get the parts. But when you're putting so much of yourself into these things, and you're finding yourself reading for, you know, the, you know, the guy on Law and Order who said they went out the back door or something, it's not as exciting as you want it to be. So I, I had enjoyed that process of writing the first time the autobiographical thing, but it, it had taken a while, and I thought, I wonder if I could write something if it just occurred to me kind of quickly and see how I would like the process to write something for myself to act in, if that, would, if that would work. And I just didn't want to spend that long doing it again. And I ended up writing this script that just took six days to write. <coughs> I just blurted it all out, and it was a very dialogue-driven script. And I had great fun with it, and we ended up having like four different producers wanting to make it. It was funded at like a million six. We made the film, Martin Sheen's company produced it, and Martin was in it. It went really well, and it was great fun. And I also learned about writing for myself to write quickly, um, because you get that energy on the page, and you keep that logical thread going. And, that, and pretty much that's the way I, I've written since. I haven't written quite that fast uh, since, uh, but within a couple of weeks normally, if I go through enough of a development process, um, like in my class that I teach a lot about development, but once you've done that on a story, uh, for me, I kind of like to get it out within a couple of weeks. Interesting. Um, after that, I, I I know I met you when you were at Carnegie Mellon and you were instructing, mm -hmm. and uh, at that and point... You, and you were the next Roger Corman. I, we keep I, hoping. We keep hoping. And... Uh, you, you've 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 taught screenwriting at, at, at Carnegie Mellon. You've taught production at, at New York University, um, and with all of this knowledge from acting and screenwriting and what you've been doing, you decided that you wanted to step into the producer's role. What made you want to do that? Basically, to control as much as possible the artistic outcome of what it is that I write. It's kind of a cliche to say that what you write. And what gets made is or can be very, very different and sometimes very disappointingly so. And the first two features I had done did not, to me, fulfill my intent with the scripts. They, it's just things that didn't work. I wasn't happy, happy with. So I sort of stopped selling scripts for a while. I didn't pursue doing that any longer unless there were certain conditions met. And I was with the William Morris Agency, and they were sort of like, taken aback that I, I, I didn't want to do this unless this person directed or if we could get this cast or if we could do it in a certain way because it was kind of heartbreaking the first couple of times to see something change so drastically uh, from what I intended. So I wanted to try to have more of a creative hand and more of a controlling uh, influence on things. And I've never had total creative control uh, because you're still at the mercy of distribution and editing things that can happen out of your hands. Um, financing entities, but producing is that thing that gives you more control. I mean, writers are the true creators of something, and I'm, I do the other things as well, so I'm not denigrating those disciplines, but as actors or directors, we interpret. Writers create from whatever. Um, so producing gives you a chance to at least try to see that, that taken care of in a way that keeps your original intent going. Um, you produced and directed a few projects recently with George Romero called Dead Time Stories that I've seen available on Netflix in Instant Streaming, which, uh, huge congratulations on that. Um, what gave you the idea to, to revisit a horror anthology series at, at this point in time? I've always loved them. I grew up with, like, Twilight Zone and Outer Limits, and I love Night Gallery, and I love the freedom of that form, where you can just basically have an idea, and to me, a short story like that is often uh, like a joke. It's the punchline. You have this thing that you're going to get to. I think Edgar Allan Poe said you start from the effect and work backwards. You have this thing you want to say, and you can put it together in a more quickly, and have this little punch if you can pull it off and so that was an interesting process and it was a weird uh, and wonderful thing that we got to do firstly George and Chris Romero are fabulous fabulous people 
as well as Tom Savini, who uh, directed one of the episodes and terrific to work with. Uh, but I got to write. I directed uh, one story in each of the volumes. I acted in one of them, uh, another one of them. So I got to kind of spread myself around a, a bit and go crazy. But uh, it was uh, enjoyable. But I love anthologies. I love that. Uh, I love short stories. I love to have the freedom of doing that. Um, so you got basically the entire projects financed and, and cast. You basically worked as a producer, a complete, total, legitimate producer from soup to nuts on these. Yeah, yeah, and it's that thing that producing ain't no big thing, it's a million little things. It really, really is. It's, uh, there, there are so many decisions daily that you have to deal with, um, and I had wonderful partners working uh, on it as well. But it's it is a, it's a lot of work. It's very very time consuming, and not one piece of it is difficult in a sense or uh, impossible to pull off. It's just a matter that you're doing them all at once. You're doing them constantly, constantly, from hiring to you know wardrobe to every every aspect of it. So you know, in, in exchange for that attempt at control, you do actually spend your life for that period of time doing it. But we do do these things because we love love it. So. Uh, but it, it, it's, a, it's a crazy uh, thing. I would like to do it for something that I didn't uh, create or have a very deep emotional stake in. I I'm curious about the whole process of financing because you, you've mentioned a couple of names that, that you worked with on, on the series, like George Romero, Tom Savini, who they're, they're fairly well known in the independent and, 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 and mainstream film communities. Um, through the process of financing, how difficult is it to find investors for your projects when you have people like that attached? It's always difficult. I have, uh, I was very inspired years ago. I did a film with John Sayles, and John writes his own stuff, directs, his girlfriend produces it, he's in charge of the music, he edits, he acts in them, he does all of these types of things. And I remember talking with him and just about the struggle that everyone goes through, including him, with the wonderful, wonderful work that he's done uh, over over the years. Everybody struggles, and it isn't even just with, uh, you get so-and-so attached. I have a lot of different name actors and some name directors and Academy Award-winning people attached to different projects that I've written, and it's still always, always a struggle, because this is a money business, and it's a risky business, and I think that, you know, the William Goldman thing that nobody knows anything is true. It, it's always a crapshoot. It's always a gamble. You know, you do something that you have the biggest star in the world in at the moment, and it may flop. And, you know, we've all seen things like, you know, Blair Witch Project or whatever years ago coming out and taking the, the whole industry by storm. So you never know. So getting investors is, it's really, uh, in a sense, when you're running a company, that's where you spend most of your time. Uh, because you want to do the creative stuff so much, but you want to do it in a certain way, taking control of that process of finding the money um, becomes sometimes 90% of what it is that you do. do it's always it. difficult. But we have Malcolm McDowell. I've had uh, Aaron Eckhart, Chris Cooper, uh, uh, different actors wanting to do different things, but you're all, and, and, and that's fantastic, uh, because then you're not selling a script, you're selling what's called in the industry a package. But still, it's a matter of putting it together with the right people at the right time uh, in the right way, and that's a time-consuming process. Do you find that investors uh, in, in independent films tend to want some sort of creative input into the process? Not generally. I'm very, very clear with the people that I've spoken with over the years in terms of the limited partnership and the general partner and all of that and how that specifically works. And the first time I tried to do this, um, I literally uh, went through attorneys, created a document that cost $12,000, a PPM, uh, that allowed people to invest. And that's insane. Now I deal with literally a two-page document that I created uh, that people investors read, get the full story, and have invested uh, that way. But it's very clear up front that 50% of the ownership goes to the investors, and 50% goes to the general partner, which is the film company and the people working on it. 
Um, and the delineation of uh, creative control is very clearly spelled out. And I think, it, luckily, I've been so far fortunate with the folks who have invested with me that they have trusted uh, uh, trusted me to go off and, and make something that would get them their money back. And so far, that's what we've done. Let me, let me ask you, from your point of view, what are, what are the steps involved in producing a project? First, and this might seem a little silly, but have a project. I teach uh, a lot of different things, and often people will say, I, I got this thing I'm trying to get development funds for, uh, I get this notion of an idea, of a thing. First, have a script that you totally believe in, um, however long that takes, because it will be rejected no matter what. And you know, everybody knows that every movie practically ever made before it goes off and becomes a hit, somebody rejected it. You know, Harry Potter was rejected as a book, and all of those sorts of things. So having that uh, screenplay that is going to work for you, so that you are going to be willing to stay up, you know, and, and work really hard at it because you believe in it. And you can be convincing to other people because you're passionate about this. Passion is what this business is really about. Um, once you have that, don't uh, discount the fact that you can attract name actors, name directors to it. Keep in mind that most actors do this because they love it. They did it before they were movie stars. Most actors are also unemployed most of the time. So if you're an A-list actor and you know, you're Tony Depp and you're booked up for the next few years, that's not you know who I'm talking about. But most actors, even Academy Award winning actors, are looking for a good project, looking for a good part looking for something that they want to play. And getting to these folks isn't always uh, that difficult. I mean, you can call SAG, get the agency information, contact them, uh, send a script, see if you can get some interest. And of course, the more people you meet in this business, the easier that becomes. So you can just, I, mean, I love casting, for example, as a director or even as a producer, I love casting over the phone by calling somebody who I've worked with before and say, hey man, I got the script, would you like to play this? And sure, great, you know. Um, but putting things together uh, one step at a time, starting with the script, getting that attachment, which might be an actor, which might be a director, it might be a location. It might be something, if you're doing something on a low budget, uh, I tell my students to, you know, if they're pushing around for an idea, we make lists of what they have access to that looks like it costs a lot of money, and everybody has unique assets. So you might be able to get a school, or a swimming pool, or a Ferrari, or something that I couldn't get. But if you can write scripts around, sounds kind of backwards, but we've had some phenomenal success with uh, students coming up with really great screenplays that started actually with a list of assets. So you can have this production set up. If you don't have a name actor or a name director, you may have this incredible way to, to bring a lot of bang for your buck to the process. So you put this together, and then it's that idea of pitching it in a way that keeps in mind the number one thing, which is if you're out there looking for money, you have to prove that you can make money with this as much as you can. And there's no guarantees, but having everything in a row uh, is, is crucial so that people are going to believe and know that you're going to do all you can to get their money back and put them in profit as quickly as possible. Can you tell me, how did you manage to get your projects into distribution? I understand the distribution road is, is very tough and challenging. Uh, how did you manage to do it? It is. It's really crazy, and the statistics are harrowing. I mean, it's nuts for the amount of movies that are made. A few years ago, I read a statistic of how many thousands, tens of thousands of movies, uh, movies that were submitted to Sundance that year, and 0 0.3 got distribution of what was submitted. You know, very few were taken, and of those, most most movies that year at Sundance did not pick up distribution. So it was really, it's, it's, it's crazy. And that is kind of the holy grail of getting the movie, that isn't making the movie. It's getting it out there and making money with the movie so that you can do it again. Um, we've been uh, very, very fortunate in that we've attempted to set up with very limited funding uh, the best possible shows that we can, with the best people that we can. Um, our first distribution hit actually was kind of funny. 
Um, we had several, uh, maybe half a dozen distributors interested in our first film. And uh, we narrowed it down to uh, a few and finally picked one. But a second distributor kept calling us and saying, we still want to do this, and we can't offer you as much money, but we still want to do it. We still want to do it. Is there any way we can do this? And my partner at the time was uh, calling me and saying, uh, on, this pro on this project, say, what do I tell them? I said, tell them no. You know, we have a better deal. Tell them no. And I said, if that doesn't work, tell them if they fund a sequel, then we'll go with them. That'll shut them up. And an hour later, he called me and said, uh, they said yes. They'll fund the sequel. So they did, and they paid three times more for the sequel than we paid for the first movie. <laughs> so it was, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy, and it was, it was, it wasn't, uh, I wasn't expecting it, but it, it uh, certainly worked and did well for them. Tell me a little bit about your investors, because I, you were tell, you were talking about how difficult it is to find financing and how it's a challenge for everybody. Um, your investors, have they made their money back? Are they happy with, with what you've done with your projects? Yes, and that's the, that's the thing that I, I feel a great responsibility. Anytime I ask somebody for money, I always ask, what am I giving them in exchange for this? What am I doing? How, much am I, how far am I willing to go to get them their money back? And it kind of weighs on me. I know I've, I've met people in the business who were like, well, hey, it's, you know, it's a movie. You're going to lose your money. Of course you're going to lose your money. It's nuts. And that's definitely a possibility. But I have this moral thing that I, I feel badly until people are paid back um, and make money. That's why they're in, you know, doing this. So uh, I try to put that number one in my uh, priority is to get them their money back as, as quickly as possible. But they have been happily happy with that. And the investors that we've had, uh, it's also been something terrific that uh, we have a guy in Bob. Uh, 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 I'm not sure how much he, how much publicity he wants. He's a very shy guy, um, uh, but he's a terrific uh, gentleman who's really interested in certain aspects of the business. And right now, we're putting together a project shooting Ireland uh, that he has wanted to make for a few years, based on the script. And recently, he said, "Hey, you know, what if we set this in Ireland? Would that work?" And I said, I definitely think that it would work in Ireland. So we, uh, Bob has paid this lady in Ireland to write a song called Running Out of Sometime, uh, which you can now hear on SoundCloud, which is our soundtrack. Uh, and we're putting together uh, the project called Small Time Crime. It's a uh, crime drama, a uh, romance. And it's uh, because Bob and I enjoy the whole Irish thing. You know, we're, we're getting something out of this. We're getting money out of this, but we're also getting the chance to travel and to see things that we want to see and have those experiences. So that's what happens with a lot of investors. They get to be a part of the process or participate or be an extra in the film or watch how it's done or, you know, go to the premiere or whatever. So whatever interests them, that's what I want to give them. So the key to financing is to create a film that investors can vacation during. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be terrific. You know, just, you know, so uh, anything I could possibly set anywhere. I'll go anywhere, man. You want to travel? I'll write something for you. We'll go there. It'll be a thing. We'll do that. So, I, 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 we're, again, we're speaking with Jeff Monahan of 72nd Street Films in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Jeff, I, I met you uh, at Carnegie Mellon, and you and I have been friends for, for quite a while now. Um, yeah. And I've, I've used your consulting services a few times for projects that I've done. Uh, I understand that you've expanded your offerings and you offer services to consult with new and intermediate level producers and writers to help them improve story and marketability. Um, what are some of the common mistakes that you see people making with regards to story? Basically, ignoring their own expertise. I always tell people that when you start to write, or if you want to direct, or if you want to actually, you want to make films, don't forget that you've seen thousands, tens of thousands of these things already. And it's kind of shocking sometimes when you're teaching a class of would-be directors, screenwriters, what have you, they seem to throw out all of their previous knowledge and want to start fresh. You are an expert at certain things. You are an expert at making movies probably in some way 
because you've seen so many of them. You've had the experience, and you've seen movies that you didn't like, that didn't work, and didn't involve you. If you're a fan of a particular genre, if you're a horror movie fan, or like romantic comedies, you, you're an even further expert on that. You know what works. You know what you like. And so don't ignore that. You can really, you can really get a lot of value from things you already know. Combining your already built-in expertise with common sense You've seen movies. You know that you know there's a lead and things have to happen, and it's a series of events. It isn't a theme or an idea or a notion. Things happen, and then something else happens, and then something else. So don't ignore that uh, expertise that that you might have. Uh, and seriously, that it is um, for my writing classes. I think just that this is a series of events that takes us on some sort of a journey uh, inwardly. You know, it, we may go somewhere geographically, but it's going to take you on some sort of a trip mentally and emotionally so that you come out different, uh, differently for having seen it and experienced it. So that series of events, because sometimes you get people saying, you know, it's about love. What about it? I don't know. You know, so, so what happens and what happens next? Uh, that's basic, but it's something a lot of people just kind of ignore. So that's so, sometimes it's just the basic things that you have to not learn. But realize you already know, so don't ignore that. I have a uh, question from the Stick Cam audience that was instant message to me. What does Hello there, Stick Cam audience? <laughs> what does HDWK mean? <laughs> that means, how do we know? For a long time, I can't remember if it started when I was teaching at Carnegie Mellon in the graduate program there, but so often people would frustrate me because they would write things in their screenplays that you have absolutely no, you can't shoot that. Keep in mind this is a movie, it's not a novel, it's not a short story. So uh, how do you shoot something? Therefore how do you write it? So that when somebody is reading your script, I don't want anybody to read my script. I want them to watch my movie while they are reading those words. So you shouldn't write anything that you're not going to see or hear. So how uh, HDWK means how do we know? And eventually someone, I forget who it was, had me a stamp made because I would write HDWK on so many things. And they gave me a stamp to stamp HDWK on, on it. And I, ne I never used the stamp. I kept it, but I never used it because I thought that was rude um, uh, if I did. But uh, learning basically how to write in that language that you are writing, what is visual, and what we can hear, and not telling us things that we aren't going to uh, know unless we're actually, you know, um, unless we weren't reading, you know, reading a novel. So, again, nobody should read your script. They should watch your movie as they're, as they're looking at the pages. I mean, HDWK from page and back. Jeff, thank you again so much for joining us today. Uh, next you, week... Jeff. On the Brown Bag Lunch, a mystery guest. We don't know who we're going to do, but it'll be someone fun and someone informative. So be sure to join us then. Thank you again, everybody. Take care.